Yeah. So, so you said you had some questions. I'd love to know what, you know, obviously what did Mike, what has Mike told you about me? You know, he's connected us and, and I'd love to know that. It's, it's probably about the same thing he's told you, which is you need to know this guy. That's um, it. You have so much in common. And so I'm, yeah. I'm curious about what all those commonalities are. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think I, yes. Uh, soccer. Ooh, I don't yeah. know this one. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm like, so, uh, our, uh, put it this, what team do you cheer for in the premier league? Ooh, in the premier league. Um, let's see. I right now, gosh, you know what? I'm just going to answer it truthfully. I don't cheer for Please. any team. Okay. I don't, I don't have a, a team because for me, I'm so competitive that I just want to see a really good game. It's okay. kind of like my same answer to college basketball. Um, I live in North Carolina, but to be honest with you, I don't care about Carolina or Duke. That's fine. You're not a you're not a native uh, Carolinan, so. But but college football. Um, when I tell people that I grew up in Chicago and the only thing we watched on TV was NBC, therefore Notre Dame. But I have no connection to Notre Dame. No reason okay. to like them except. Okay. They were better than Northwestern, Illinois. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that doesn't take much. <laughs> There's no way we were going to root for Wisconsin. So, no, 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 no. So that's the no. only reason. Okay. Um, I, can, I can go with that. I can jump off there. Um, Premier. So, yes, Man City. Oh, okay. For one reason. Uh, what is it? Uh, um I don't know if it's called All Access. I think it's All Access on, yeah. on Amazon. Okay. I watched the Man City All Access program probably three years ago, and I was like, I admire Pep Guardiola tremendously because of his, his leadership style. Ooh, yeah. Okay. And that's why I became a Man City fan. Hmm. And, you know, growing up playing soccer, you know, we never – you didn't even know the Premier League existed. I mean, heard people talk about could never watch anything, never do anything, so was never into it. And only in the last couple of years now have watching that. And now you can watch every Premier League game you want on TV, whereas ten years ago you couldn't in the U.S. And so um, I have become a Man City fan, and it is again just from a leadership perspective, it's Pep. Yeah. So um, I love watching leadership through the eyes of coaching as well. Um, but I, I think growing up, I had the same experience. And so the only soccer that we got to watch was when a major broadcast actually played an NCAA final or the World Cup. I recorded yes. most of the World Cup in Spanish because they were the only, <laughs> they were the only ones showing well the the sport the world's greatest <laughs> event so is this pre-94 because i know we're the same age okay. so is this you were, were you watching like pre-94 world cup yeah 19 oh, okay 1990 world cup i have vhs recordings of most wow. of the semifinals and finals um i think my parents finally gave me the box you know the one okay that, the, yeah um and I found VHS tapes of the 1990 World Cup when okay. Germany went into PKs. Okay. I found old recordings of the NCAA men's soccer finals. Wow. Um, of course, there were some old VHS tapes of myself playing, but okay. we won't talk about, won't talk about those. <laughs> uh, but, but no, it was okay. that, that was the only way to watch soccer, right? Yeah, so, I mean – I, to me, watching soccer, I mean, I grew up, I started playing when I was kindergarten, first grade. And so in the Midwest, that was like early. You were like, what is this sport? Like, you know, especially small rural town in Ohio. Uh, it wasn't like it was massively popular and, you know, started playing. And so I remember really watching the 94 World Cup and I was a midfielder and yep. I fell in love with John Harks. Yep. And so, uh, through sports, I wanted to wear number six and my son, uh, yeah. my son, who's 13 now, who's the soccer player in our family. He wears number six.
Perfect. And it is all because, and I was telling him the other day, you know why I like number six? And he goes, I don't know. It's like he got it. It was first, and I was coaching him. Like, I'll give him number six. And uh, so I told him it's because of John Harks. Very cool. Okay, so 1994, um, World Cup was in Chicago, one of the locations. And I lived in Naperville, Illinois at the time. Mm -hmm. I was going to Naperville North High School. And the Spanish team was okay. training down the street at um, Illinois Benedictine College. Okay. And it was two miles from my house. So I would go and sneak over there and kind of sneak past some guards to watch through the fence at the Spanish team doing the training. Wow. So, uh, I sat a couple rows back on the end zone at Soldier Field for Spain, Germany. And uh, those those were just really, really fun. Oh, then, absolutely. I was in France for the World Cup. Really? I won't I won't talk about getting stuck in the Tunisian English riot, but Ew, that's not good. Yeah, we were yeah. uh, I was actually over there with athletes in action. Okay. Um, but I I want to go back to Ohio. Where where in Ohio did you grow up? Uh so northeast, halfway between Cleveland and Columbus. Uh okay. so a little town called Worcester. Um that is where I grew up and uh yeah. Uh and what what did you play for a local club or a larger club in Ohio? Uh, no, I just played at that point. I, I remember there was one club, but I played rec. I grew up on a farm. Cool. Um, and so for me to be able to play soccer, it was just kind of, you know, I played rec, but, uh, you know, played into high school and I kicked myself because I should have, um, I should have tried out at least when I went to Cornell. Um, I don't think I ever would have been, I, I wasn't, I was never a technical player, um, but I could see the field and I, you know, had size, you know, at that point um, by, you know, senior in high school, I was 5'11", 165, 175 pounds playing midfield. And so uh, yeah. I played physical. That's the ability that I had is if you were going to move the ball through the midfield, you were going to pay for it. And that's my ability, what I had. And um, again, I kicked myself for not at least trying, um, but. I don't know if I would have ever made it, but so the yeah. uh, so I was a center back. Okay, and I played pretty much the same way. I I did not have a whole lot of skill, but nobody was going to outwork me. Uh huh. And, um, if you tried to get past me, I was just going to take you down. So uh huh. Um, yes. But yeah, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, played for um a pretty big club in Chicago it was called Pegasus at the time. Okay. And uh, I was I was curious because one of the guys I played with, oh, I think went to Cornell. Oh, really? And he was from Rockford, Illinois. And I'm I'm trying to put together a name, but anyway, uh, he would have been there at the same time because I was looking at you graduate high school in '96. Yep. Yeah, yep. I graduated '97. Okay. So I was uh, graduated to Cornell in '01. Okay. Yeah. So um, anyway, we'll, I'll come back to that one, but. Yeah. Um, very cool. So how'd you end up at Cornell? Uh, I got recruited, um, for dairy cattle evaluation from the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I grew up, I was in 4-H FFA, um, you know, showing cows, doing those things, but I also, they have a contest where you evaluate animals. And, uh, so I had won the state 4-H contest and, uh, State 4-H contest, state FFA contest, did a lot of it nationally around. And so um, Cornell has an animal science department as it's a land grant college. And so I was recruited to go to Cornell for that. Uh, we ended up winning a uh, the national contest when I was a junior contest they held for that. And then as a senior, won the national contest as well. So, um, oh. yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's one of those things that. Uh, as I tease, it is accomplishment that really in the grand scheme of things doesn't mean a whole lot in the world, but, um, well, yeah, isn't that Tyler, isn't that most things? Um, I, I would say, yes, it, yeah. it really, it can so, be. So whether it's cows or soccer <laughs> in the end, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, yeah. so my, the only reason that I didn't respond uh, sarcastically or really <laughs> my, my wife grew up in Wisconsin 
And oh, okay. Both, both of her parents grew up on farms uh, nice. that were dairy farms, and her uncles are still milking cows. Okay. So come on, dude. I'm like, uh, yeah. Okay, whatever. That's normal. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's one of those things coming to grips with uh, each of our abnormal is really normal. <laughs> if we just accept it as normal that each of us have a, you know, a wildly different, you know, how do we get here to where we are? And I think that's, that's aging. I mean, that's, you know, as you get into your forties, you don't really care as much. Yep. Um, I think that's a great virtue of gaining wisdom and learning. And, you know, for me, Hey, I, I wouldn't trade those experiences at all. You know, I look at the, when, when I think about speaking and, you know, people are like, Oh, Tyler, you're, you know, you're pretty articulate. You're able to speak. I'm like, I started doing it when I was eight right? and I started doing it probably, you know, I had a lady one time I was, um, I was speaking at, at an event and I don't know how many, um, there might've been 12 or 15,000 there. I can't remember how much it was. And she was so nervous and she's like, are you nervous? I'm like, no, not really. And she goes, why not? And I said, because it's a lot easier to talk to 12,000 than it is one when you're talking to one and right. they're in they're sitting there and they're, you know, drilling, you know, holes in the back of their head with your eyes. That's a lonely place to be. I said, that is no fun. Give me tons of people. You look around a crowd and you, somebody is going to be smiling and just keep with that and just keep looking for the people smiling. And it's when you're talking to one, which I did, all the way from eight up until, you know, a senior of college, because part of our, our contest was you had to give reasons for why you placed animals the way you did. Yeah. And so you were talking to one person and, you know, you'd have to do this six or seven, six times as part of the contest each time. And, you know, you talk about being nervous is you're trying to justify why you did something across the table from someone who thinks that you could be an absolute idiot. <laughs> because why did you see it that way? And um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, that that's cool. I mean, we've got we started on soccer, <laughs> yeah. Then we went to cows, and now we're on to speaking. So yeah, um, people ask me the same question, and I tell them, when you spend ten thousand hours on any stage, you better become better at speaking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I'm so thankful for the time that I spent at Elevation Church and, uh, you know, nothing like time after time, after repetition, after repetition to, uh, refine your skills and abilities. Oh yeah. And then put a clock in the back and hit zeros and that'll refine it even further. Oh yeah. So, totally. Totally. It's like. Oh, you know, it, it was funny. And I got into this habit of when I presented and people would, you know, they'd get so nervous. And, and again, I wasn't doing weekly. It was just events here and there. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure my role is to make sure this event keeps moving along. So I will aim to leave two or three minutes there on the clock. That will be my goal. And so, um, and then people backstage, they'd be freaking out. I'm like, no, it's all good. I'll, I'll, you know, watch that and make sure we get to that point to where, Yep. Um, you know, there's some time left on the clock because I don't want to be that guy that just is rambling on, rambling on, rambling on. It's like, come on, get to the point. Let's go. But, yeah. No, it's a, it's actually what I, what I learned is that if somebody gives you a clock, it's a matter of honor mm -hmm. to honor it. Yep. And, uh, you, if somebody asks you to come and speak, you are on their time. Yes. With what they give you. And so, yes. anyway, yeah. Well, um, really cool. So, uh, you know, I know what I've picked up. So went to Wheaton, played soccer at Wheaton, um, had an opportunity to go to IU, which was a powerhouse in the late nineties, early 2000s, decided not to. Yeah. So that's what I gathered. Um, and then end up in Charlotte because of soccer too, right? Correct. So uh, how, wh where'd you go? Where'd you go get the information from? Um, I, 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 I have this mentor that, that is really impressed upon me, the value of preparation. Um, one of his mentees is also another friend who I just was on, a, but just recording a podcast with, uh, he impressed upon me that much as well. And so it is the, the value to be able to go and investigate 
and listen to other podcasts and don't repeat the same thing, but learn about people. So cool. I went and investigated and, um, that's what I learned about Chris. So, um, yeah, John has impressed that upon me. And then the guy I was referring to is Don Yeager, uh, yeah. who, uh, I don't know if you know, Don, great guy. Um, cool. you know, former sports, uh, illustrated editor, author, um, has a phenomenal podcast called the corporate, uh, competitor podcast. And that's one of the things that Don and I have talked about. And, um, you know, as he said to me, even again this morning, it's like, Tyler, your preparation, our conversations and our relationship are the things that open up doors. Yep. And, you know, so. So, so yeah, I, um, that is all true. I grew up <laughs> in soccer. Um, I'm a pastor's kid from the Chicago area. Uh, my dad was on staff at a church called Wheaton Bible Church and then mm, yeah. Naperville at Naperville Evangelical Covenant Church. Uh, so I did my middle school and high school years in the public schools in Naperville and um, had a, had just a really cool opportunity to to develop my abilities and then just be seen. And I learned a lot about life my senior year in high school when I tore cartilage in my knee. Oh, and that hurts. And um, refused to give up. So I went to the How did you do that? Well, I just said to the doctor. Like, no, how did you tear the cartilage? Just in a... In, in a game, in a cut. Okay. Um, and, uh, I mean, realized I couldn't walk the next day. And, uh, the, the doctor was basically like, hey, look, you're not going to do any more damage. So it's just a matter of you handling the pain. And I so desperately wanted to play my senior year. Uh, so r the, the funny story is, you know, I had a few different opportunities to play at schools, but, um, I get a call from Jerry Yeagley who was the head coach at Indiana kind of late in my senior year. And I said, and he said, well, you know, Chris, we, we've heard a lot of incredible things about you. And some of my former players have seen you play. And I, cause I was trying to figure out, you know, like how does a coach of a D one program find players? And I was just more curious than anything. And he just said, well, um, the players who have played for me, I trust their opinion the most. Mm. So, um, I don't care about what people say. I don't care about the videos people send in. I don't read all the letters. But when when I have a former player call and say, you need to check this guy out, I don't even check him out. I just call. <laughs> so I got a call and flew down to Bloomington and sat. I mean, the, the best part about the trip was sitting front row for, well, I was actually it was in John Mellencamp seats at okay. Assembly Hall for the Michigan Indiana basketball game when oh. tractor trailer was playing for Michigan. Oh yeah. And um that that was just a really, really fun experience. And, sure. and again, Jerry Yeagley and Joe Bean, who was the Wheat Wheaton College coach, they were like the two winningest coaches in NCAA at the time. And they knew each other. So they actually when I finally decided to go to Wheaton they called each other and congratulated one another um, for this kid named Chris Allen. And I, God got a hold of my life my senior year in high school, and I knew it was where I was supposed to be. And he honored that decision. Um, my time at Wheaton was incredible. It set me up for what I'm doing now in life and met my wife there. And, okay. um, and then at Wheaton, was in two national championships. Uh, we went 66 games unbeaten and I lost like less than 10 games in my entire four years. So it's crazy. It was just a fun, really, really fun yeah. experience. And I would do it all over again. Um, so yes, I, that's my Wheaton story. How much of what you learned at Wheaton um, really created this, this foundation of understanding how important culture is? Huh. So I went to Wheaton thinking that I was going to be a youth pastor because, again, God had gripped my life my senior year in high school. And so I, I started out majoring in Christian education. And I had a, a couple incredible professors there that just mentored me and took me under. And soccer was one part of that leadership. Um, and the culture of the Wheaton soccer team and then the culture at Wheaton College is really what got me thinking about this, but I realized 
when I took my first business course that there was a part of me that God had wired that couldn't be fulfilled just in Christian education. And so I was trying to figure out how I could get all my classes done in time while playing soccer, while graduating early, because there was a possibility that I'd be drafted into the newly formed MLS at the time. Mm -hmm. And I went to sort of one of the deans and said, how can I pull this off? And, and they said, well, we don't have a business minor, so you'd have to double major, but I don't think you have enough time to do that. But we do have one other option. It's called interdisciplinary studies. And I said, well, tell, you know, tell me more. Uh -huh. and, uh, they At Wheaton, they basically have a program where if you can prove the validity, you can combine different studies or courses into a single major and so I, I graduated formally with an interdisciplinary studies major, but it's a combination of Christian ed, business, and a couple classes in kinesiology. And I, and I called it like Christian sports ministry. But, but really what it was in, for me was a combination of business and Christian ministry. And so I pretty quickly realized there's a, there's a, piece that's missing in our churches today in our christian organizations and it, and it feels like it's this understanding of business but then in the business world i feel like we're missing a part of what we see inside churches and christian organizations and our understanding and love for people mm -hmm. so could you bring these two together and create a healthy culture where you have the best of both worlds and um, the other part of my story is that my dad was a pastor and my uncle was a successful attorney. And so I had pastor and then my uncle had three daughters. So I was like a son to him as well. So okay. I had uncle, the, uncle Dave was the attorney. Paul Allen was the pastor. And then I became 50, 50 split. And that's where the love and the passion for culture came in. And I don't think I realized that I had a gift in this area until I got to the Charlotte Eagles uh, down here in Charlotte, where I live now. But I spent the preseason with the Chicago Fire. They didn't keep me. Came to Charlotte, which was like the AAA baseball of the soccer world at the time, called the A-League. And uh, we just, we stayed here. So that that's where it all began, culture-wise. Yeah, it, well, I mean, I think what's, what's awesome and and is that when you, when I think the greatest display of culture in our society is in sports. And the reason why it's the greatest display is because it's the most visible and studied the outcome. You know, we can look at, at business P and L and we don't see that publicly. We see a sports record, you yeah. know, a team record publicly. And so the bearing of the teamwork, the culture, the environment, those old things, and especially over time, you know, for you to go, you know, 66 and 10 during your college career, that is a massive display of culture that, you know, progresses over time and, and has success. And, and so when you see teams that do that, you see organizations that continually grow. Um, and, and as I recognize what I see in, in the places that you've been that have amazing culture, um, it only goes to, again, create that major foundation of importance to all outcome. I completely agree. And I think that while you can see the record and you see the measurement sort of publicly, what you don't always see is the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So assumptions can be made. And actually, that's a whole nother conversation. We can get into the perceptions of culture. Sure. But the the healthy cultures you see almost um over performance you see people exceed beyond expectations mm -hmm. and so we can have expectations of a of a great team or a great player and we can think they're going to win but there's something about all of us that loves the underdog loves the story of the team of a bunch of misfits or the team mm -hmm. of underachieved bad news bears the yeah that and every great sports movie hoosiers is, is that story of that overcoming mm -hmm. and it's because Major league i mean that's right that's right it's 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 like it's that 
whole concept of saying, man, we love it when you can pull a bunch of people together and make something great happen. And Tyler, I think the other part that I maybe left out is I watched my dad as a as an associate pastor his entire career. Um, I've never heard a bad thing said about my dad. So many people love how he cared for them, loved them well. And I watched the culture that my dad established, organization after organization. And when when something would fall apart in a church culture, which it always does, um, my dad was left there holding the pieces together. And, and then when a new leader would come in, my dad would move on to the next experience. And so I think part of my cultural experience, even before Wheaton, was just watching my dad. And what, what was instilled in me was, this is still about people. And on a soccer team, the, the way to make a team effective is to take the guy who's the lowest in the ranking, whatever that means, and make him or her feel like they are as much a part of that team as anybody. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you separate out and create a hierarchy on the team, you lose the, you lose the ability to encourage people, develop people, bring people mm -hmm. along. And it's often the person that you least expect who ends up having the greatest impact on a win, sure. winning season, a winning team. And yeah. that, that has just always been a part of kind of culture for me. And then to, to also think about the role of a coach in culture. Oh, and, um, yeah. Biblically, I think coach is our modern day shepherd. And so when you think about a coach, a coach is somebody who they know that they have individuals for a season, not forever, a season. And the goal is if I can get the most out of each individual for the betterment of the team, we have our best chance of winning. And I think we lose perspective in leadership in general, when we think, oh, well, I'll have these people forever. And if I can just make a couple individuals better, we'll be effective. And then we all get upset and insecure when somebody decides to leave. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, wait a minute. If you were a coach, you would expect that they'd leave. So you, we should just expect that they're going to leave. What, what can I do to make them the best possible person while I have them and then celebrate them moving on to what's next. And mm -hmm. so I think coach in the context of team is a incredible example of leadership in culture. Well, it, it's, it's so much healthier. I mean, you establish it, just pin on that last point about the, when you, you realize and you have these people for a season. And you're, you're there to the, say, hey, what can we accomplish in this season? And I'm going to welcome you in when you come, and I'm going to cheer you on when you go, knowing that a part of each of our growth means that we're going to have to separate. And we may come back at some point in time, whatever that may be. But if, if, if there's angst, if there's tension, well, then you've not only created a situation with that relationship, you have inadvertently affected every other relationship because people see that if somebody leaves and you, and you, you know, you tear them down or you make comments or whatever, me, Oh, they're leaving. They're not going to have success. They're not going to have that. Well, then everyone else is sitting around saying, all right, well, what happens when I move on? What are they going to say about me? Or now all of a sudden, how secure do I feel in my role? What am I contributing to the team? Am I, you know, I know that guy was an amazing, you know, performer, whatever sport, business, whatever it may be. And I view that of them. Well, what is he, the coach or the business leader, think of me then? And we start making up all these stories and, you know, to John Acuff's recent book, Soundtracks. And then all of a sudden they start really creating this like toxic environment as opposed to when you're abrasive and saying, hey, people are going to come and go. And we're going to create this community, as I like to call it, an incubator community rather than an incinerator community. Then all of a sudden, we're going to get the best of everyone. Absolutely. And, and I think what people miss is that if I create a culture like that, 
all these people who were developed and who grew and who had a great experience move on to what's next and talk about what they came from. Yes. Which just continues to make the culture that they came from even more effective and it attracts more people to it. And so the, the ability to take talent and I, and I, I think I would say this about Wheaton college and you, I mean, you can talk about other schools too, but it's like, what Wheaton has done is created a culture and even from a soccer standpoint where all of us have left and gone on to other things. And I don't remember the scores of games. I don't remember much of, of anything. I probably had too many headers, but I, <laughs> what I do remember is the feeling of being a part of that team and that mm -hmm. um, I don't think I could have gotten that many other places. And that's mm -hmm. what a great culture does is it leaves you kind of going, man, I wish I could have that again. And mm -hmm. how can I create that where I am now? And, I, and I, so a great culture um, replicates itself through people as they leave and go to other places. And what an honor when you can point to somebody and say, they spent time in our culture and look what they're doing now. That's, yeah. that's more honoring than Hey, look, I've kept 100% of the people who started here and we're all getting old together, you know, <laughs> like that doesn't, that's well, you know, that's, you know, from a, from a leadership perspective, that's not only good, but it's also bad. You know, I look at that again, it's like, Hey, if people grow outside of the walls of whatever organization I have, that's great because then I helped grow them to somewhere else to where they're going to be able to accomplish. But then also brings in the opportunity for someone else to grow in that are going to bring different experiences and different ideas. And then that's how you grow. And instead of, you know, putting walls around, well, we're just going to stay very static, very status quo, which is just being in the mess we're in. Well, all of a sudden the abnormal starts to become normal. And you're not challenging yourself to say, oh, is there a better way to do it? Can we serve people in a, in a more dynamic way? And I think that, again, comes into the leadership challenge of being the bridge between generations. Hmm. Because if, if we try to operate as leaders, how – you know, it's been done every day before you and I, you know, started every, you know, it's been modeled. If we try to apply that to everyone that is younger than us, to me, we're going to do a disservice because they've experienced different situations and they have different skill sets and different opportunities that really need to be led differently. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, if I start to go into that, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, and I don't, you, you tell me if you want to yeah, go, let's do it. Okay. I mean, at this point it's, it's, Hey, we're having a great conversation. And to <laughs> me, I, that's where I learned the most. So, all right, next, let's roll with it. Next. Let's gym. Do it. Um, first of all, uh, I was with a company yesterday and one of the comments that came up was the millennials <laughs> and and i'm and i'm thinking the millennials the millennials are 40 so if we're still talking about millennials we've missed a generation yeah uh gen z hit the workplace last year because technically 1998 and on is gen z i'm still waiting on what they're going to call this in the next generation <laughs> but um We've got millennials and Z. I just prefer to call them next gen because yeah. technically you and I are the end of gen X. Yep. But mentally I really want to be a millennial. And so we're, 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 yeah. we're to me, we're, we're in that cusp, but we are the Xennial is what I call it. It's Xennial. Uh -huh. And ha have you heard what else they call us? Um, no, but I, I'm, I'm yeah, smiling cause I'm going to laugh. It's it's good. It's, we are called the Oregon Trail generation. <laughs> okay. Because we played Oregon Trail. Uh-huh. On yes. the Commodore 64. Oh, and yeah. It was oh, yeah. a little green blinking thing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but we, we, were that, we were in that category of as technology moved, I mean, we were in college when the internet came. Yeah. We, I started college with an eight megabyte gateway laptop. And I finished college with the ethernet mm -hmm. and, and it was like, 
what is this? Dial yeah. up internet doo, 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 at the beginning of college, and all of a sudden you've got wired dorm rooms by junior year. Then we come out of college and we've got cell phones. Mm -hmm. They're flip at the time. And then as we enter the workforce, the, we're moving into Blackberries. Yep. And then obviously 06, 07, you move to the iPhone and, and the generation. But now yeah. we've got an entire generation that's grown up with technology. And yet they want the same things. And so, Tyler, one of the things that I've been really studying, and a, it's a bit controversial because it's a secular model. But if I just take a scientific secular model, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we just apply it to what people are looking for today. The most basic need is physiological, air, mm -hmm. water, food. Then the second need is safety, which shelter and employment, your job is considered a second level need. The third level is love and belonging. The fourth level is self-esteem. And his top level of the pyramid is called self-actualization becoming the best version of yourself, which I think is funny anyway. But when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for generations past, employment has been a second level need. It was a job. And I'm gonna find love and belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization through other things. My family, my church, organizations in the community, whatever else. We now, have generations, and I'm not going to talk about one, I'm just going to talk next gen, yep. where um, the family has been splintered, mm -hmm. people don't go to church anymore, and they're trying to find those other needs some other way. And so people still have a need for love and belonging, they still have a need for improving self-esteem, and they still have a need for becoming who God created them to be. And they're trying to find it in the workplace now because I'm not going to find it at home in my family. Half of them are broken. I'm not really going to find it at church anymore because even the healthy churches don't really do a great job of it. Mm -hmm. So I spend more waking hours in my workplace. I want to feel like I'm loved and I belong to something purpose driven organizations. I want to feel like I'm improving my self esteem development, leadership development, coaching, and I want to become the best version of myself, self-actualization. So now you have a generation that's saying, this is what I want in the workplace. And you have previous generations who are calling them entitled, but they all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that previous generations didn't even know you could ask for that in the workplace. Well, I, I think what's funny is I've, you know, gone down this path a little bit myself and, and look at some of the generations and we establish and we look at it just like right now we have this, this older generation, we'll call it, you know, the baby boomers in the workforce that are having this commentary about the millennial Gen Z. However, when the baby boomers were first into the workforce, the generations, you know, 40 to 60 years older than them were saying the exact same things. It's been documented. You look back at the, the, the transcripts and the books, and it was the same thing. It's this same generational evolution, and it's not new. It's just all of a sudden our experiences are different. And therefore we, we, we evaluate and rank differently because you know what, in the 1900s, someone who was very, very, very rich had in the 1950s, that was table stakes. And so what people in the 1950s really aspired for by the 1980s, that was table stakes. And so it's this, you just changing of, of generation, but yet we're all looking for the same things. One piece that, that really, I think you, it's, it's what causes our society to be polarizing is this definition of community. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's to me, we, we've had these, these tensions and issues in workplace and society and, and wherever else, because what we assumed as a values are not transcending because of different backgrounds and, in different country of origin, whatever else. Uh, there's a book by Jason Dorsey, Z economy. And he talks about it is 15 year olds 
in the United States and different countries around the world have more in common today than a 15 year old and a 50 year old in the same house Hmm. because of just our, our world is flat. Our experiences are so much different than when you and I were 15, where we did have more in common with people of our own country that were 15 than we did people in other parts of the world because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the technology where there's equalization across cultures. And, you know, as I've learned through that and try to grow through that and see, I, I, this is my, my great belief is you and I are prime example worth, you know, same age. We are the bridge between these generations that you bring up and it's how healthy we become as leaders will affect will will equate to our effectiveness in what we're able to do um, as part of a purpose with people. Okay, so let's see if we can bridge some of what we've been talking about. Yeah. Because take if you take the concept of a coach mm -hmm. and a team, mm -hmm. and you take Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the leader that can bridge the gap is a leader who says, "I know what." people need. They need more than just physiological needs and safety. They need to feel like they are loved, valued, and belong to something. They need to feel like people believe in them and they're growing in self-esteem. And they need to feel like they're being developed into who God created them to be, or in secular terms, the best version of themselves. And so the leaders who can bridge the gap are the people who will come alongside people, make them feel like they belong to something great. They're valued in the process. They are learning and feeling better about themselves and their strengths, and they're becoming a better version of themselves. Those are the leaders who will bridge the gap. And, and yet most of the leadership, and again, I'm, obviously our friend John talks all about valuing people, um, but, it still, it's always about people. It's yeah. always about people. Well, so to me, what I would say you described is a healthy, empathetic leader. The, the people that lead, that, that do what you just said, they're a person that's healthy, meaning they're come to grips with themselves, their own insecurities, their own fallibilities, and they can accept that and understand, hey, there's a place for it. It's okay. I, I can, if those are, are, um, you know, are dangerous. If they're causing harm, then I'm going to work on those. But hey, I have insecurities. You have insecurities. Everyone listening to this has an insecurity. It's okay. We all do. And when we can accept those and say, Chris, you make me better because what you bring to the table match with what I bring to the table cancels out our insecurities, right? And if we, if we look around at teams and, and understanding that, to me, that is a practice of empathy, of saying we can do that, of exactly what you said. Those leaders are what I call empathetic. And I think empathy is very, very misunderstood, just like humility is very, very misunderstood. And that's where I believe this process of getting healthy is, is learning about that empathy, learning to care more about what's important for that person who is, you know, doing a role in your business, because they're not just a person doing a role in a business. They're maybe a, a mother, they're, they're a sister, they're a daughter, they're, they're all those other things that come into that whole hierarchy of needs in life. And if I only worry about, are they going to show up to work? Are they going to do what I tell them? And are they going to be here tomorrow? If that's all I worry about, then we're lost. Yep. So I, um, if I could, let me yeah. just tell you, this is, this is the framework of how I believe cultures established in organizations. And it starts with the individual. And I call it individual clarity. And it's a person coming to an understanding of their strengths, a person understanding uh, their replenish, the, what replenishes them, understanding their weaknesses, their insecurities, their belief systems, attitudes, and habits. Because if I can make those healthy, or at least aware of those, that affects my leadership clarity, which is vertical relationship, it affects my horizontal relationship, which are all the relationships that I'm healthy with. So how do I resolve conflict? How do I collaborate effectively? How do we aim for something bigger together? Um, and, 
And then that affects organizational clarity. And organizational clarity is like, hey, what's the mission, vision, values? What's the structure? Where do I fit? What's my role? How do I win every day? What's the process around here? What's the communication? How do I find out what's going on? And what's the brand clarity? Like, are we who we really say we are? <laughs> yeah. So Tyler, like, this is my work with organizations is establishing clarity from individual to leadership, to relational, to organizational. And that's what I do, man. <laughs> so, well, I, 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 I'm excited about it. That's why, you know, you know, when I think about, you know, our friend that connected us and realized, Hey, you guys, one, see the world a lot and have a lot in common. And that's what he told both of us. I think we're establishing and seeing that. I also see from your experience and from my experience differently, there's such a tremendous need. And the more of us that are talking about this and helping other leaders go through this process only will continue to enhance how organizations grow and evolve. And, you know, I know as we haven't talked about it, but um, one of the, one of the great leaders of our generation that I admire, and I know you had a major part in, you know, being involved at movement is Casey Crawford and, you know, how Casey goes out and wants to really show love to people in, in building an organization, which you had a huge place in to say, this is how we go about business and seeing the successes of that to me only undergirds this whole idea of you saying it's always about people. It's me saying we need to be the healthiest leaders we could possibly be to to really create change in the world. And I also come back and I'm going to circle this back to cows. So sure. my previous career, we haven't talked about this. I was nutritionist for dairy cows. So I did that for 13 years. And one of the things my friends and I would, would often joke about is like, it's never the four-legged problems. It's always two-legged. <laughs> and, and so it, it always confused me at some point, how can I use this experience in dairy farms and, and working with cows to where I'm at now is because every single challenge we dealt with in agriculture, every single one always comes down to two legs. And it's always about people. It is always about people. And I look back and say, man, the, the, the businesses, the leaders that embrace that as opposed to, you know, having this, you know, well, I have to deal with people. Oh, they're, they're unforeseen problem. I wish I wouldn't have to deal with it. It's like, no, you get the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. That's what your business should be about, whatever your widget is. And if you focus on that, man, you're going to create massive change in the world. And it doesn't matter what industry, it, none of it matters. It's just, how do we do that with people? Well, we kind of started this conversation saying, whether you are picking the best cow or <laughs> winning soccer games, in the end, it's really meaningless. Like there's nothing new under the sun and it's meaningless, it's meaningless, it's meaningless. The only thing meaningful is your relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, if people were never involved, things would be a lot smoother. But because you now have people involved, they, we create challenges. And so, yeah, whether you're producing a widget or nutrition or consulting or mortgages or whatever you're doing, writing books, um, it's still about people. Mm -hmm. And the lasting impact and the, the meaningful purpose in your life will be not what you created and amassed and what you bought and purchased and how much debt you're now under. It'll be the impact that you've had on these lives around you. Yeah. And I, I think that like, that's probably been ingrained in me from my dad to my earliest years where I go, man, um, it's so much about these relationships and leadership. The empathetic leader of the future is somebody who says, no, like I put myself in your shoes. I care about people. And in the end, I know that I can accomplish this task, this role and these responsibilities by collecting the right people versus forcing people to do things that I want them to do and never having any friends. And, mm -hmm. and again, I mean, 
I, I know we've sort of joked about it, but I, it's still always about people. Yeah. Well, and it, it's, it's about people on that pathway to be the healthiest, you know, most self-actualized version of themselves and knowing that is a journey for all of us mm -hmm. because every day in life we have experiences that are, are baggage or traumatic or whatever. It, it's, it's going back to when you were a, a senior in high school and, you know, you tear the cartilage in your knee. It's like, how do you get through this? How do you press through that experience? Um, other people, you know, different experiences. And it's, it's looking back at those experiences and saying, what values did I get out of that? But also, I think it's very important as I look at my experiences there, what blind spots did that develop? And, and knowing that I have to as much understand the values but also then recognize the blind spots because those blind spots are what are barriers in our relationships. You know, for me, and I'll share this uh, is, you know, when I was 14 and my younger brother died mm -hmm. and, you know, when I, the accident and um, how I dealt with that is I put my head down and pushed because that's how I got through things. Yeah. And so through high school and in college and in much of my early career, it's how did I get through things? I just put my head down and push. And so that's how I dealt with things and had to be a blind spot exposed to be able to say, oh, well, that's a problem because I push people away as opposed to putting my arms up and endearing people because I want to go through it with others. Uh, so since I'll tell you about an issue that's sort of I've recognized, um, I, uh, I feel like I've been striving my whole life. Okay. And um, I don't, the, the core of it would be somehow I haven't arrived and I've, and I've got to win one more thing, whatever that thing is. And the best image that I can give you is that in 1997, we had just won the national championship for division three soccer. We had just beat the college of New Jersey. And I remember watching all my teammates run guys on the bench, run across the field and pile up and, my goalie who was behind me because again i was center back ran past me to the pile and i remember watching as guys piled on top of each other thinking is that it like when's the next game like is that can't we win a, can we can we win at a higher level can we play somebody else can we can we compete again and that has become a blind spot in my life that I've had to continue to work on, which is I can never take time to celebrate because I'm always trying to figure out what's the next thing I strive towards. And um, I don't think it's healthy just to put that out. There. I think some people yeah. might argue, well, that's the competitive nature of Chris. No, it's actually not all that healthy um, because I don't really even know what I'm striving for. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I just am striving. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. the thing that I've been kind of working on and God's been continuing to sort of work in me, getting to a place where you could go, okay, this is what I do. And I'm now striving to have a greater impact on people, not to keep winning at something or amassing mm -hmm. more money or mm -hmm. doing bigger roles or whatever it might be, taking mm -hmm. on more leadership. And mm -hmm. so I, that's the thing that, Again, our experiences teach us so much. Can I speak into that? Go for it, please. I believe at that moment, and I've you know had other moments in competition, and it's been something kind of relate to that. Is you know, it's like, is, is this all it is? It's like early. I believe there's twofold. Is one that really is undergirded because that's not your purpose. I believe when you when you see that, it's like, okay, I can do this, but yet it's not my purpose. And then all of a sudden, when you find your purpose and like, this is what I'm here to do, then it becomes to where I want to go do more, not because it's it's what can I get for me, but I see the impact it has on others. And right. I think you're starting to do that now. And I'm guessing as you do more stuff, like we're having this conversation, you're seeing less and less of that. I have to strive to accomplish more. It's like, can I do more of this because of the, the purpose and the value that you get out of serving people? The other part of that is I, I also believe at some point in life, we all get across a finish line and we say, is this all it was about? Is this is what it was? 
and, and I believe in, in something that I've embraced and, and love is it's about the journey. Mm-hmm. It, it's like for me, it, in, in my experiences and understanding, it's not the, 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 it's not the, the, the game. It's not the championship. It's not the, you know, the contest in the arena. It's not that that's really fulfilling for me. It's the process and journey along the way. It is the growth that, you know, and I know you coach some of your uh, kids. I know you coach soccer. It is seeing that kid who the first day he's giving all of his heart. He's got a great attitude. He's just on the team because he's on the team. And at the end of the season, he has grown and developed. And all the other kids rely on him at some point. And he is that kid that makes the difference. That to me, that's what all the value is in because you see that process and you're like, yeah, let's not have an end of season. Let's not have a championship. Let's just keep going because everything that has grown, it's just step after step after step after step and and all the people that come along with it. And so as you're telling me, I I think when you stop and, you know, I saw your face kind of light up as you said, yeah, it is about that. And I've had a really good mentor that's helped me understand that because as I see him model, that's what he does. You know, that's what John does. It's kind of like, I'll do this forever because yep. I see what it does in people's lives. And I'm like, I want all of that. Yep. No, uh, that's what makes a, what is it? 73 year old, 74 year old for 74, get up every day early and keep going. Yeah. Uh, that's what makes a 74 year old stand out in 90 degree humidity in Guatemala and sign yeah. like a thousand books while sweating. And then we're walking away and two guys run up with two last books and all of us want to protect John. And he says, I'll sign your books. They go. And as we're walking away, John says to everybody, listen, listen, People will never remember what you told them, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, drop the mic. We keep walking. Okay. We all feel like idiots. All right. Game over. But I mean, that, that's it, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, and I think what's great is we get people in our life and, and we look for them and we seek them out. One, find a place in that circle. Number two, are able to help each other grow in those lessons to say, hey, there, there, there's a better way to go about this. There's a better way to, you know, check off the championships. There's a better, um, you know, record to account for. And it's like, did I make a difference today? And if I did, great. Let's do it again tomorrow. Amen. Uh, Let's go. So.